Welcome everybody. My name is James Faulkner. Um, today we're very lucky because uh, I'm joined by someone who has distinguished himself during a, a long career in economics in the City of London. Here to discuss super forecasting over the next five years with me is Jerry Lyons. Jerry, welcome to the show. James, great to be here and thanks to everyone for making time available in their schedules to join us. Thank you. Um, I could probably spend the entire webinar recounting Jerry's full list of accolades, so I'll do my best to give you just a flavour. Jerry rose to prominence after his prediction that the Lawson boom would become a bust in the late 1980s. He was also at the forefront of predicting Japan's lost decade and saying that the West would move to a period of low inflation and low interest rates. More recently, he spoke accurately about the imminent rise of China and its consequences. A month before the financial crisis, it was one of only two UK economists predicting a, a deep and imminent recession and that UK rates would stay low for a prolonged period of time. And to cap it all off, he even foresaw Brexit and its consequences. These days, Jerry is chief economic strategist at NetWealth. And of course, uh, many of you will be familiar with NetWealth through their regular attendance at the Master Investor Show. But for those of you that aren't, NetWealth is a leading UK-based wealth manager, enabling clients to model their own investment goals against variables such as tax rates, risk levels, and account types using an award-winning technology-enhanced approach. We are taking questions, um, but I'm going to intersperse these throughout the presentation in order, to make, in order to make things run a little bit more smoothly. So please do keep these coming as we speak, and I will try and get through as many as possible, but sorry in advance if we if we don't manage to get to your question um right let's uh, let's kick off then jerry um so to to sort of look ahead and to to make any any type of forecasts i suppose we need to um we need to look at where we are now and you know obviously the elephant in the room at the moment is the the pandemic and the mm. fallout from the pandemic um so just give us a, a brief overview of what you think the the, the main implications are of, of, of that. And um, and I suppose you want to sort of um, split these up into your, your three Gs, as you call them. Oh, very good. Yes, the three Gs. I wrote a piece in The Times a little while ago talking about the legacy of the pandemic. And I said that I thought it could be best thought of in terms of the three Gs, grassroots, green and geopolitics. Grassroots in the sense that people will now start to buy more things closer to home. Companies are more focused on resilience in their supply chains. So supply chains might indeed move back on shore and come closer to home. So that's the sort of grassroots aspect. The green, I think, is a natural consequence of something that was already in place before the pandemic, a greater focus on the climate change agenda. I think that's been reinforced by the focus on the health agenda because of the pandemic. And the last G is the geopolitical environment. After the global financial crisis a decade ago, or just over a decade ago, the focus was on G20, the group of 20, the emerging as well as the industrialized countries. More recently, as we saw in Cornwall, a focus on the G7, the group of seven countries. But I think the reality is that we're moving to a G2 world, America and China, and geopolitical tensions will come to the fore. So I think they're the lasting legacy, but as investors look ahead, I think they need to sort of factor those in, but also think about where we currently are in the cycle. And we have a combination of rebound, reflation, and inflationary pressures. And I think the world economy, the UK included, will grow very strongly this year and into the early part of next year. Indeed, whichever economy one looks at almost any time, the outlook depends on this interaction between the economic fundamentals, policy, and confidence. And if we bring it, James, to where we are now, the fundamentals point to a strong rebound in pent-up demand. The policy environment is pretty loose, combination of fiscal and monetary policy. And confidence is recovering, although naturally confidence depends on which country you sit in and how the vaccine rollout and the pandemic is being affected by that. So it's a complex picture, but in a nutshell, um, financial markets are reflecting a strong rebound in the world economy and the UK economy included this year. I think that's correct. I think financial we can show that in the, the chart, can't yeah. we? The first chart, if somebody can just bring that, that one up for us. Yeah, chart, put chart that into eight. context a little bit. That's right, James. This, this chart is from the UK, from the Office for National Statistics. It shows the level of 
of the economy in terms of GDP. And as you can see on the right hand side, we effectively fell off the edge of a cliff last year. That was when the pandemic hit and it was the lockdown really. So March, April, May, the UK economy collapsed, world economy, similar picture. Then last summer it bottomed, then we moved up and we had a mini peak in October. And then we went down again in the second and third lockdown. And then where we are now, this is data for the end of April, is 3.7% below the level of last year. I wrote a piece a few months ago on our website for Net Wealth saying that one way to think about this, because when you start to talk about numbers, it's often difficult to sort of portray them when we've had such a collapse last year and such a rebound this year, is that the economy effectively at the end of 2020, so last December, was back at the level it really was in 2014, if you looked at that chart. And by the end of this year, the economy is going to be back to the level it was um, at the beginning of last year, so 2020. So effectively, we're going from where we were in 2014, to not that there was anything special about 2014, we're going from where we were in 2014 to where we were in 2020, not in the space of six years, but probably in the space of six, seven, eight, nine months. So when you get six years growth concentrated in six, seven, eight, nine months, that's a strong rebound. The challenge, of course, James, as we know, is that not all sectors are benefiting. Some, the creative industries and the tourism sector, still held back. Not everyone is in the great shape. Some people, over 3 million people, still on furlough. But there is a lot of pent-up demand and high savings that will be spent. And markets are sort of looking at where that money is being spent. And so it's a strong rebound. And the picture is similar in other countries as well. I'm just wondering, in terms of um, when we look at what the consequences are of, of this and and how it's you know shaping economies, to what extent are the implications simply a, an exacerbation of existing trends, or you know can we can we find any any new trends in there on top of that? Yeah, well, there, I think there are a combination of both in answer to your question, James. The the pre-crisis trends which dominated. Uh, investors thinking two years ago are still there. They've been sort of submerged, shall we say, because of our focus on the pandemic and health and locking related issues. But the two pre-crisis trends will re-emerge. And then on top of that, we've got the policy legacy of this crisis. And that's a real challenge. But if we take each of those in terms, we take pre-crisis, um, the two dominant themes, in my view, are going to be dominant themes for the next five years and possibly longer. One is a regional aspect, and the other is a fundamental change in economic outlook. The regional aspect is the emergence or the growth of the Indo-Pacific region. And the Indo-Pacific region stretches from India in the West to America in the East. It's basically, instead of us looking at the news and the map of the world with the UK in the center, this is very much, if you're thinking investment-wise, looking at the world with the Pacific in the center. It's trans-Pacific. It's reflecting the future emergence of India. One in 12 people in the world is an Indian under the age of 27. That's a wow. demographic <laughs> dividend if they really get their growth picture right. Obviously, demographic challenge if they don't. Then you already have China as the second biggest economy in the world, but it's income per head still very low down. So it's still got a lot more potential. And then you clearly have America at the forefront of the technological phase. And that leads on to the second big driver, not only the emergence of the Indo-Pacific regionally, but the underlying key issue, the fourth industrial revolution. And James, I've got a slide here, slide B, if we could put that up. Because when people talk about the fourth industrial revolution, it's a bit mind blowing because there's so many different facets to it. But if you just took a moment to look at this, each of these features is in their own right important. But when you think that all of these are happening at the same time, this is profound change. Profound change, which could be very positive because I think it means the global economic cake is going to get much bigger. But when you have change in just one area, there are relative winners and losers. When you have change across the board, it makes it very complex. But just look, disruptive technologies, one could argue net wealth in terms of wealth management is an example of that, albeit at a small level. Big data, people really don't focus enough on the data issue maybe. 
a digital and data revolution, artificial intelligence. These features will keep inflationary pressures subdued, even though other factors, as we'll probably talk about, point to higher inflation in the future. Enhanced connectivity. That's why, say, in the UK, as a service sector economy, we talk a lot more now about trying to trade with Pacific countries. The green revolution, very expensive, but it's a revolution. Genomics, life sciences, you can look at that list. But the point is that, coming back to your question, James, yeah, the pandemic clearly really going to have an impact this year and next year, a lasting legacy as well. But the pre-crisis trends in terms of the Indo-Pacific and the data digital revolution, the fourth industrial revolution, all of that is coming again, in my view, to the fore and will be dominant features for investors as they look ahead. We probably don't need that slide anymore now, but I think the message has been made. And then, of course, we've got the policy issue as well, the policy legacy, which I think is a real big challenge. Um, the policy stimulus last year was phenomenal, and understandably so. But when you step back, global debt, public debt, is now at an all-time high. Just think about that. At the same time, central banks, despite their notion of independence, have basically become so integrated to the political dynamic. Central banks' balance sheets have exploded. Interest rates are at very low levels. So looking ahead now, positive outlook quite clearly in terms of growth, those pre-crisis trends transforming the world economy, and then on top of that, the real big difficult issue, how policy will play out. And I think that's a good point to pick up on, the whole um, monetary policy issue because it does seem over recent years that that's been the main driver of, of markets not just stock markets but all asset markets um yeah where, where next for monetary policy because you know we, we kept assuming that um central banks had kind of exhausted all the the tools in the toolkit but they seem to always be able to come up with something else don't they um yeah. and and feeding into that we've got a question um from Eugene Bromberg, what, what's your view on commodities and gold in particular? Because obviously that has a very strong link with this, uh, this issue, doesn't it? Yeah, um, maybe I could take Eugene's question in a moment because I think the policy picture um, is the real key one and then it leads on to the inflation picture. But yeah. in, in, uh, and Eugene's point about commodities and gold, I think very much fits in with the sort of investor consequences of inflation. But maybe if I could take the policy. Um, there's a slide, slide um, G, I think, <laughs> trying to remember what the slides are. <laughs> I, I've had these in the background, hopefully anticipating some of the issues that people might want to address. Slide G shows central <laughs> bank's balance sheets. Now, I'm not going to assume many people spend any time looking at central bank's balance sheets. But this is for three central banks, the US Federal Reserve, the Bank of Japan and the European Central Bank. And on the left-hand scale is trillions of dollars. So this scale is about big money. Back in 2008, in the wake of the global financial crisis, central banks stepped up to the plate and they started to print money, reflected in their balance sheets. But it's continued. In the last decade, central banks have effectively been the shock absorber for the world economy. They've printed money, you could say in some areas as if it was going out of fashion, but they printed money and their argument was inflation was low, inflation risks were muted, therefore we were justified in our actions. But the message from this chart is just looking at these three central banks is in the last couple of years, central banks balance sheets have really become bloated. Um, if one looks at interest rates as well, slide H, um, this is for the Bank of England. You could say that, again, this picture is similar elsewhere. The trend has been down for policy rates. Uh, guilt yields have also fallen in this environment. It's before the financial crisis, the previous governor of the Bank of England, Mervyn Coon, called it the nice environment. No inflation, constant expansion. And then we had the <laughs> financial crisis. But the message really is since 2008, We've had central banks, and we probably don't need the slide anymore, we've had central banks basically um, providing the stimulus. And in this pandemic, we've had unconventional monetary policy, unlimited monetary policy, 
and on top of that, unconventional fiscal policy as well. Where next for central banks? This is a big issue, um, and it's, it leads on to Eugene's question on inflation. Um, central banks are now looking for a new mandate. Initially, it's a focus on the pro-growth, and the pro-growth is understandable given the debt picture, but it comes with an inflation risk. The challenge is if we start to see central banks having to take on the mandate that some are calling that is for inclusion, I'm all for financial and other inclusion, that if central banks start to become diverted from their fundamental economic mandate, then it starts to build in not just an inflation risk, but maybe a financial instability risk in the future. So what central banks do do is far more important maybe than people always think about in the longer term, as well as naturally, we know it's very important in the shorter term. For the moment, central banks um, are very biased to keeping rates low. But if I could show you slide F, I think this is why things need to change. Um, this is the Bank of England's quantitative easing in printing of money. My own view is central banks should be tightening policy now. My view is they should be tightening policy gradually predictably. Just to uh, clarify, this is cumulative as well, isn't yeah. it? This yeah. is cumulative. Now, this is the Bank of England's bond purchases. So we think of this in terms of quantitative easing. In 2009, it was 200 billion. And then you can see it's progressively increased up to 895 billion, of which 875 billion is government debt guilt and 20 billion is corporate bonds. I personally at the time was never in favor of the Bank of England of going into the corporate bond market. It was an unnecessary interference. But the challenge is this, back in fe February, lots of uncertainty, we were in our third lockdown, health risks. Then the Bank of England talked about possibly having negative interest rates by the autumn, and that they would continue to expand QE to 875 billion of gilts, 895 billion. Now, six months later, their view of the economy has almost changed 180 degrees. They're talking about strong growth but yet they are almost on autopilot with their QE policy. I personally would have voted um, to have scaled this back. So I think in answer to your question earlier, James, I think central banks need to be exiting from their cheap money policy. Um, I think in the UK, they should be doing it by rev not buying any more gilts and then eventually quantitative tightening, selling some of those gilts back into the market, but withdrawing, raising interest rates um, probably comes later, but certainly one could argue in terms of whether one raises rates or whether one um, reduces the size of the balance sheet. The challenge, of course, is, as we all know, central banks are now the big buyers of government debt globally. Central banks are intertwined, as I touched on, with government policy, and I think this is a problem. And it leads maybe into the inflation question about whether inflation, which is picking up now, is a pass-through so it's temporary, whether it persists, which I think it will, or whether it becomes permanent. And there's lots of short and longer term features. But Eugene's question about inflation um, linked to gold and commodities, commodity prices have picked up uh, because of the strong rebound. China also is moving to a dual circulation policy. I'm, I'm on the board of Bank of China in the UK, I should say, so I follow China very closely. But China is trying to boost domestic demand. So the global rebound, the change in policy in China, combining to push commodity prices up. Also partly because of the green agenda in the hydrocarbons area, some firms are finding it hard to raise the finance. So that probably means that we're going to see underpinning firmer hydrocarbon prices, oil prices in particular in the next one, two, three years. So all of those features point to commodity prices being higher. In terms of inflation, inflation in itself, sorry, in gold rather, gold in itself is um, an asset people like to hedge against inflation, although in our research at net wealth, we would suggest it's not always the best to hedge against inflation, but also it reflects a sort of a, a financial instability concern as well. We would not be advocating buying gold um, sort of as the best hedge against inflation, but coming back to Eugene's question, yes, commodity prices have already firmed up. I think oil and hydrocarbon prices will remain firm for the next couple of years. Some of this is partially reflected already in market prices, but it comes back to the challenge facing 
people when they look at the inflation outlook and there's a lot more issues there. Is it temporary pass through? Is it gonna persist? I th would say more persisting. By that, I mean pre-crisis inflation, sub 2%, hovering around 1% maybe, um, post-crisis hovering around two to 3%. Um, inflation only becomes permanent if there's some fundamental changes or some big policy mistakes. You just kind of answered my next uh, question, and that was uh, from Adele Fakhri, um, and that was, what is your five-year forecast on UK inflation? And I suppose, um, as you as you touched on, that the key um, question with inflation is that once we as we know from from past experience once inflation does kind of you know once the genie gets out of the bottle it's very hard to put back in isn't it so um yeah and with with this particular latest round of monetary easing we have actually seen you know money being handed out to to people directly rather than you know being used in the financial economy and going to financial assets so um is it is it kind of are you of the opinion that you know that that is at the root of of what you see as a you know leading to a, a higher inflationary environment the fact that we're now going directly to to uh, to consumers um the answer is partially yes james and in answer to yours and maybe adele's question could i ask for slide c to come up um even though adele's question was about uh, the UK in the next five years, and I will answer that explicitly in a moment. Let me just put it in the context of the graph here for the US. It goes back to 1970. Could have used a pretty similar picture for the UK. The point is in the 70s, we had high inflation. Um, we had inflation shocks, two inflation shocks, the 1973 oil price crisis and the 1979 oil price crisis because of what happened in Iran with the revolution then. But superimposed on this was relatively loose monetary and to some extent fiscal policy as well. Inflation became entrenched in the 70s. And then we trended down uh, for a combination of factors. And those longer term features that drove inflation down, four came to people's minds. One was uh, wage share, uh, wages were squeezed down. Back in the 70s, it was a wage price spiral and wages really were suppressed. Then on top of that, we had globalization, China's emergence. Um, I used to say the CPI index, consumer price index should have been renamed the China price index, such was the global competition. So that was the second feature. The third feature was technology. Um, technological change means we get better value for money. We don't always see it in lower prices for things, but the quality per price means when you measure it as inflation, it's less. And then the fourth feature was central banks. Central banks tasked with low inflation, inflation expectations became entrenched. Now those were the longer term drivers. And the question is, is this changing? And let's just go very briefly through them. On the first wage share, yes. Um, President Obama, uh, sorry, President Biden, <laughs> Obama, <laughs> Obama and Biden, they blend into one sometimes in terms of their policy. <laughs> President Biden, he gave a speech, I think it was Ohio just recently, talked about how wage rising wages are not a cons uh, an afterthought, a consequence of their policy. This is central to their policy. So they want higher wages. So that wage share picture is changing and we're already seeing it in some respects. Second, globalization. Um, are we going to see, because of that grassroots aspect, some deglobalization? We don't know, but there's a greater risk there. The third longer term driver, technology, I still think that is a low inflation driver. And indeed, artificial intelligence and global competition will keep inflation low. And then the fourth factor is central banks, which is your question, James, and I think that's a risk. So when you look at those four longer term drivers that have kept inflation down, of the first one, wage share changing, globalization, deglobalization, I would still say globalization, global competition, but maybe post pandemic, not as much as pre pandemic. Technology still driving inflation down. And the fourth, the big unknown, the policy environment, but there is a much bigger inflation risk. When you look at that picture, you do have a greater inflation threat than previously. Adele's question was inflation in the UK for the next five years. The UK has managed to hit its inflation target over the last 20 years of 2%. But if we look back the last five, 10 years, actually, since the post 
financial crisis, there were two phases of inflation in the UK, both linked to sterling weakness. Post the global financial crisis, when sterling fell sharply, post the pandemic, uh, sorry, post the referendum, sorry. Um, so post the global financial crisis, post the referendum. We haven't had the fall in sterling post pandemic, but sterling falling led to higher cost pressures. Um, sterling is back to where it was at the time of the referendum. So I don't think we're going to see that pressure. It's more about domestic inflationary pressures. And I think UK inflation will edge higher, certainly will edge higher this year to over 3% because of what's already in the pipeline. Um, I don't buy into this idea that we should naturally think inflation will go back to the target uh, because that's where central banks, you have to have actions to justify achieving that target. So I would say that if we have too prolonged a period of loose monetary policy, inflationary pressures will build more to 3% or so. Uh, the challenge, of course, I was thankfully at the forefront, but a few others are saying that we were going to move to that period of low inflation. And you mentioned this, my coverage of Japan, et cetera. And the relevance of mentioning that now, and it's a warning sign to all of us looking at the markets, is when we move from high to low inflation, markets were slow to adjust. They didn't quite believe it. There's a sort of group think, you tend to think status quo, where we are now is where we'll be. And the danger, of course, is that you can always go from low inflation to much higher inflation without really realizing that, always explaining any tick up away. And I think it comes back to your question, policy needs to be tighter to keep inflation genie in the bottle. And to what extent um, does the, assuming we are going to have higher inflation over the next few years, if that's a given, do a lot of these technology stocks and other growth stocks and in inverted commas, are, are they looking really vulnerable now in terms of valuations? And I know you're not obviously, you know, um, your bread and butter is kind of macro forecasting, but just taking a look at the markets, is there anything there that scares you? We've got a, a question from Donald Grant, what is the future for technology stocks? And then a lot of similar questions asking about um, that, that side of the market. And um, I know a lot of people are quite worried about valuations in that area. What, what are your thoughts? Okay, um, first to be clear on inflation, um, it's about whether it passes through, whether it persists or whether it becomes permanent. And permanent, um, so passing through is that we just get inflation up, down, and we're back to zero to 1% inflation. Persisting would be inflation more two to three percent. Permanent would be really ramping it up. I'm not expecting us to go to that permanent pickup of inflation where it's, but I think we go from a sort of passing through to more persistence in inflation. So I think it's very difficult to be precise because there are so many dynamics as I've touched on. But if we say more the three percent rather than the one percent, at least three percent is not five, six, seven, eight percent. But it's so it, that's the sort of ballpark where I'm looking. It's a positive on the debt picture we might come on to in the moment. Mm. But in terms of the value versus growth stocks, value um, naturally can benefit from the cyclical rebound we're seeing, the, the rebound in economic activity. And we are going to see some incredibly good earnings growth projections this year and next whether those costs in those firms can be kept down and their margins remain healthy um, is what's going to be important then. In terms of the growth stocks, it's difficult to uh, argue against growth <laughs> when you look at the um, fourth industrial revolution features that I've talked about earlier. When you look at Silicon Valley and the intangible um, investments taking place, and when you look at the sort of drivers across some of the Indo-Pacific region, the challenge, of course, for all investors is as much because of the policy context. We've had loose fiscal policy. Governments don't seem in any rush to tighten fiscal policy. We've had um, very loose monetary policy. But maybe take a lesson from China. China rebounded strongly this year. Uh, not that what happens in China is replicated elsewhere, but it highlighted the sensitivity of the credit cycle because they've tightened credit conditions, albeit just marginally in China, to keep inflation in check in their mind. And that's seen a loss of growth momentum. So growth stocks 
have something going for them in terms of their ability to continue to outperform uh, because of that structural shift globally. But the challenge from Donald's question is, I think, trying to anticipate the policy environment. It's the fact that we have very loose monetary policy. If we have a gradual predictable phase of tightening, the markets can start to cope with that. Is if markets are suddenly left to uh, be hit by an inflation shock because policy has not tightened early enough or they've left to cope with a policy tightening that's aggressive when it does occur. I think that's the real challenge. And um, you, you talk about the um, underlying drivers of the world economy. You wrote, wrote the book, The, the Consolations of Economics. Um, oh, the four main points in that are hard power, soft power, institutional power, and then economic and financial drivers. Can you just take us through how those kind of, um, you know, uh, what sort of implications those have in terms of like the, the global picture at the moment? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that was written back in 2014, but it stood the test of time. I also talked about health issues in that, actually, <laughs> or in the context of SARS, not that I'm saying I'm predicting the pandemic <laughs> or anything like that. Uh, but yeah, each of those, I think, is still very important. The hard power is military spend. But, um, hard power was really reflecting what I think we are going to see in terms of the emergence of the G2. Uh, the US and China. And that means you do have tensions. Two, three years ago, we saw them in terms of the trade picture. Uh, now you're likely to see them in the South and East China seas and the Cold War um, in some respects. Soft power is very interesting because the UK is very well positioned in this. But also it comes back to maybe some of your uh, question from Donald and others about growth stocks. Intangible assets. People used to find it very difficult to think, how can the company be so highly valued when it wasn't making money? And when you look at intangibles and brands and soft power, you then start to realize that and top level sales and how people buy into brands. So soft power, very important. Um, and the UK universities, very big soft power, as well as uh, other aspects. The institutional is often overlooked. When people talk about infrastructure, there's hard infrastructure, road rail, we're all used to that, broadband, if you can get good broadband, um, soft infrastructure, skills, training, education, vitally important, but institutional power, really key. And economies that often do well have institutional power. They have the right institutional framework. I don't think we always have that in the UK, but globally, we've seen a big shift in this and the Belt Road Initiative from China is now being counteracted by the G7 trying to actually look at global infrastructure, uh, its flavor of the month. But institutional power, very important. But the economic and financial drivers, um, there are so many factors. Perspiration and inspiration might be a quick way of thinking about them. Perspiration is demographics. Uh, more people buy more stuff, the emergence of the middle class, particularly across the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the fact that in the West, people are getting older and people are pretty wealthy, particularly if they sit on housing wealth in the UK and Western economies. And the inspiration is the technological change and the artificial intelligence, the future work. So all of these drivers, the global economic cake is getting bigger. Look, we, we can be so pessimistic when we look at the world economy, but what we need to do is look back. And let me give you three figures, 32, 62, 100. $32 trillion was the size of the world economy in the year 2000. $62 trillion was the size of the world economy the year the financial crisis hit. In 2022, according to the IMF, the size of the world economy is going to hit $100 trillion. Now, these are nominal figures. So it's growth plus inflation. But while we're talking about inflation now, over the last 20 years, inflation has been relatively muted. So the bulk of that is economic activity. What we need to make sure as economists or people as investors is to recognize that this global cake is getting bigger. How is the cake divided up? Because that has implications for policy and politics and implications for investment. The global cake is getting bigger, but the if you slice it, much more of it is going to the emerging world, 
And America, because of technology, is making sure, while it's not part of the emerging world, it's sharing in that growth. Western Europe, including the UK, is seeing its slice getting smaller. Then if you split it within countries, then you have, people always talk about the 1%, but it's asset price inflation has soared. Central banks have contributed, in my view, indirectly to that growth in wealth inequality through asset price inflation. So how the cake is cut within countries is a big issue. And that leads to all the political issues, I would argue, that we're seeing in recent years. So all of these factors come into play. But when you look at it, the world economy continues to get bigger. And that's a quite a remarkable thing, given all the pessimistic issues that we see on a regular basis. And another part of the uh, the, the cake, um, as you as you call it, that's getting bigger is um, is the renewables sector, isn't it? Along yeah. with the infrastructure sector, and yeah. we've got Robert Barton asking, "Are renewables in bubble territory?" You know, what, what are your thoughts on that, Robert? Okay, um, let me put up a slide. D. Um, this is climate change, and Robert, I'll come to your question in a moment. Allow me this slight detour. Um, just to put this in context, I'm on the advisory board of the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment at London School of Economics and Imperial. So I've been on it since its inception just over well, about 11 years ago. Um, this shows CO2 emissions. It's, look, I assume we're all aware of this, but I think it's worth putting this down there just to get the context. Uh, we probably don't need to dwell on the graph, but climate... 11 years ago, when I was at the LS, was at the Grantham Institute, when it started up, um, people used to think talking about climate change was a competitor to growth. It was growth or climate change. The positive in answer to Robert's question at the moment is people now see addressing climate change as part of the green and growth agenda. And that's a constructive aspect for these ESG climate renewable stocks. Um, that is, it's now embedded into way companies are trying to do things and countries are focusing their attention. The challenge is though that, the, while I'm pleased that people are taking this on board, I think we need to have some expectations management, a bit like England winning last night, suddenly everyone's now talking <laughs> about us winning every competition in the future. W addressing climate change is important, but it takes a long time. Net zero by 2050 is a huge ambitious agenda for the United Kingdom. Other countries have ambitious agendas. When you think how embedded we are to hydrocarbons, it's difficult to move that easily. But that move is a positive one. It's also incredibly costly to move to away from gas in, uh, in rural areas or to actually do many of the other changes. Electric cars are expensive in many different aspects. So the point is that I'm really engaged with this, but I would like to, on the positive, in answer to Robert's question, yes, uh, these uh, stocks, the renewable agenda is a positive one, um, but there are big costs associated with it. Maybe a lot of the good news is in the price for some of these. I think, the challenge and the opportunity is that we don't have enough investable assets where we can place our money. If you more money is being put available to be invested in green technology, green investments, uh, but there is a, still a limited number. And this goes to the heart of Robert's question, because when you have more money placed chasing few assets, it naturally inflates the price. Yeah. Another way of looking at this completely tangential, but I have, I've used it as an example last week, London house prices. 30 years ago, London house prices was local supply, um, local demand. Then suddenly London went from being local supply to global demand. And global demand supersedes <laughs> local demand, and that suddenly pushes the prices up and makes it unaffordable for many locals, of course. But if you think of it in terms of climate change, We've got green assets we want to invest in. Before, there was a limited amount of green money, to, if we can call it green money, to go into those assets. Now we suddenly have people wanting to invest a whole lot of money in green assets, but we don't have that in green asset pool getting bigger 
at the same speed at which the money to invest in has got bigger. So that naturally inflates those prices. You might longer term think it's justified, but it means that near term, the price, the price is fully reflected. I hope that answers your question, Jane, or Robert's question. I think so. And um, yeah, I suppose it closer to home um, in the UK, obviously we've got the, the leveling up agenda yeah. um, and the whole renewables thing fits into that, doesn't it? So um, just talk us through um, what your thoughts are on Brexit, because I know you've been quite outspoken um, um, regarding Brexit and how, you know, how the UK is going to carve out its new position in the world to your mind. Yeah, um, I think um, you can't leave something you've been in for over 40 years and not expect to have a, some impact from it. I called it an economic shock prior to the referendum, um, but I'm constructive about Brexit. But it's not just leaving the EU, it's about what you do once you've left. And indeed, many of the challenges levelling up that you've asked about, James, these were issues that were there before when we were in the EU, <laughs> uh, but they weren't because of being in the EU. So it's not just... Um, everything to do at Brussels is what goes on in Westminster and locally here. Uh, but I think we need to move on from it. Um, and I think it's vitally important we don't sort of replay the last five years. So I, I try to avoid using the word Brexit if, if I can. Um, we need to ha sensibly have a good relationship with the EU, uh, but it's also vitally important that we need to get our domestic agenda right and our global agenda right. And that's where we are. In terms of the global picture, I think the UK is right to be looking for open markets. It's like right to be trying to join the trade organizations um, to do with Asia. Uh, but of course, uh, everyone's become a trade expert. Um, I remember writing a few years ago that we should remember that you don't need a trade deal to trade. Um, we trade heavily with the US without a trade deal. Trade deals make it easier for those people favored in the trade deals. But we also need to start thinking about this from the consumer's perspective as well. But that's a complex area. But it's the domestic agenda, James, that you quite rightly argue and ask about. Prior to 2008, the global financial crisis, economists used to think that the UK's trend rate of growth was somewhere around two and a quarter percent per year. Then each year, even before the EU referendum, the trend rate of growth has been revised down. No one's quite sure where it is now. We're heavily influenced by recent past, but economists will probably put our trend rate of growth at 1.2, 1.3%. Um, not because of Brexit, but because of whole combination of factors. The key issue in the UK is to get that trend rate of growth much higher and more sustainable. Leveling up is interesting because the UK is an imbalanced economy. It has some of the most cutting edge technologies, cutting edge sectors, even outperforming in some areas, the States and Germany. But the problem is at the other end, I use a barbell as an illustration, but I'm not sure if the trouble about a barbell is that it looks balanced and it might not seem like the most logical thing to talk about an imbalanced economy. But the point is that you've got weights at one end and weights at another end. And in the UK, we've got weights at one end uh, city financial services, cutting edge, nanotechnology, universities, more universities in the top 100 than the rest of Europe put together, for instance. G great pharmaceutical sector. Some of, some of these sectors impacted, obviously, by events in the last few years, but generally speaking, world class. The challenge is two out of five people at the other end work in low-skilled, low-wage, low-productive sectors. And the problem has always been the long tail. The fact that while we've got the good producing parts, we have a long tail of underperforming. And this has to be addressed by many issues, including financial. I wrote something in the Times on Monday about the Macmillan gap. This was first identified in 1931, 90 years ago. Never mind going back to 1966 and the World Cup, go back to 1931 and the Macmillan gap. And that was about the shortfall between what small, medium sized firms needed and what the financial sector provided in terms of finance. Two years ago, the Bank of England, in the response to the Future of Finance report that they had commissioned, said that this gap, they didn't call it the Macmillan gap, but this gap was 22 billion pounds, so it's huge. So in terms of leveling up, there are lots of structural issues that we need to address. Now, if investors are looking at this, what does it mean? I think we're going to see a greater focus on the infrastructure spending, a greater focus on trying to boost investment, 
either through development banks or local finance initiatives. Uh, we're going to see a greater focus on innovation, maybe leveraging our universities. So there's going to be pockets of growth. And that hopefully will then start to reduce the sort of in inequality that's evident. Uh, but all this takes a lot of time, but it does require a, a pro-growth agenda uh, for the UK. And maybe if I could take it on, because I know time's tight, the real challenge for the UK is a slide I want to show you, and it's slide E, James. And it's a real important question, not just in terms of the growth and the leveling up, but if anyone is really serious about investing, they need to be thinking about this, not all the time, but they need to think about this occasion. This is about debt, public debt to GDP in the UK. And on the right hand side is now 100%. So the UK's level of debt is up to the size of the economy. And as you can see, it's soared in the last 10, 15 years. What does this mean? How do we get out of this? Now, the headline is don't panic because I've tried to put it, well, I put this in the historical context. This shows UK debt to GDP goes back to 1692, but go back to just where we were after the second world war, which is the big peak um, you can get data, it, it depends on the time period you use. Sometimes you can use a shorter time period and get that figure going above 250. But um, in a nutshell, at the end of the Second World War, for a justified reason, UK debt was two and a half times the size of the economy, 250%. Now it's the same size of the economy. So it's a high level now, but it's high before. After the Second World War, and this is a policy issue at the moment, how do you get out of the debt problem? Some people say you inflate the debt away. I don't think that's a policy choice. It might be a consequence because of the issues we talked about earlier, but it's not what you focus on. Ideally, you basically try and grow your way out of this. By growing the economy, your tax base rises, your tax revenues pick up. And after the Second World War, debt to GDP came down gradually through a combination of focus on growth, money GDP grew, but also the problem for investors is the counterpart to this was what was then termed financial repression. Interest rates were kept low, savers were not rewarded. So the way out of the debt problem now, and it's linked into our ability on the leveling up agenda that you talked about, is to try and get debt to GDP down, not by inflating it away, uh, not by taxes that cripple your ability to rebound, but hopefully by having the longer term strategy and delivering growth that allows the debt G GDP to come down. The challenge for the UK is a challenge faced by all other Western economies. And this comes back to the issues about monetary policy as well. So it highlights the difficult, and it's almost where we came in, James, about post-pandemic, strong rebound, post-pandemic, the longer term drivers, but also post-pandemic, the policy challenges as well. And I just want to bring in a question from Alan Edwards at this point, and that's what is the future for London as a world financial centre? Because presumably that's that's something that we can end, end on with a, a positive note, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, um, yes. Um, I've done the 70, I've written the 75 page report for policy exchange, a think tank on London and the UK as a financial centre and the UK's financial industry. Um, look, I think we really need a strategy for the UK in terms of growth. And also, I think we need a strategy for the UK in terms of the financial sector. We had some, I would say we had a period of benign neglect in the last few years. Um, now is quite good with the Chancellor that he's engaging. A policy for, for the financial sector needs two parts. The financial sector engaging with the domestic economy, um, making more funds available to invest here at home, regional hubs. And the other part is linked to Alan's question about making sure that the UK remains a global competitive financial centre. And in that respect, then London still does incredibly well. Um, because of last few years, uh, the relative share of Amsterdam, Dublin, and Luxembourg would increase, but from low levels uh, to, but still remaining relatively low in the sense that London 
will remain the dominant financial center of Western Europe uh, and by a long way. Uh, there will be some relative change naturally depending on business models. But London needs to remain competitive vis-a-vis -vis not just um, other centers within Western Europe, but more particularly versus the States and versus emerging centers in Asia. Um, the Hills report talked about challenges with listing. We need to have the right regulatory environment. In the 1960s, London boomed because of uh, the US placed constraints on itself and the Euro dollar market grew up in London. In those days, the Euro component was meant as international. So it was like international dollar market. Um, Continental Europe could, if it went down the path, it seems that, or continues down the path, it seems to be going create a walled garden to try and uh, get the financial business into the EU. In which case, London could easily see itself becoming, shall we say, the Euro Euro market, the offshore market for Euro denominated securities, because it's the competitive place. And it leads on, Alan, to your question. You see, for London to do well, it's the same challenge for other international financial centers. You need to have the fundamental characteristics, you need to have the right regulatory environment, and you need to have deep, liquid, broad markets where clients want to do business. And I think London has those. And maybe the other thing that's come up post-pandemic is whether the London vibe will return, whether it will be the place that people still want to not just visit, but work and live in. And I think that's one of the challenges as we come out of the pandemic, how London will eventually be impacted. Will it return to normal? Will it still be the global place people want to be, or be in? Um, I would say yes, you might have a different view, Alan. But I think in terms of the financial center, it's about inherent characteristics, the rule of law, time zone, language, the right regulatory environment. And that's up to us in terms of what we can do. And it's making sure we're, we've got deep, liquid, broad capital markets, and it's the place clients want to do business. Good. Well, um, I think that's a, a nice place to end it on a, on a positive, uh, positive note. So um, please, uh, please do keep an eye out for the, the follow up um, survey, everybody, um, in your emails. And I think we're just about to get a, a screenshot of the next event. So there we go. So put that one in your diaries with uh, Jim Mellon on the 15th of September, and that's at 2 p.m. Um, and all that remains is for me to thank um, thank Jerry for his time today. It's been a really interesting discussion, and I hope we can get you back at some point for another one. <laughs> well, thank you, James, and thanks to everyone for making time. If you've stuck with it, hopefully you have. <laughs> and thanks for your time. And you can always look at my comments on the R view section of the Net Wealth website as well. But James, great to talk to you. Yep, same. And thank you, everybody. Thanks for your questions as well. So uh, take care and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.